I was slated to talk about uh, leaf miner management today, um, but I'd be, be remiss if I didn't mention something about uh, uh, psyllid management. Uh, of course, as uh, Arnold uh, mentioned, and as I, I'm sure he can uh, tell you a lot more about um, the psyllid management program that is taking place, um, I, from, from the monitoring I've done here, I would say that it uh, could be defined as aggressive and um, obviously uh, one of the um, more important aspects of managing HLB. One of the things we're finding is that you know you can consider um, uh, the decline of a tree through HLB uh, infection as sort of a death by a thousand cuts uh, as that tree becomes re-inoculated with, with uh, um, and re-inoculated and re-inoculated by infected psyllids, the chances that it will decline uh, increase uh, and uh, we believe that uh, the duration uh, uh, will be much faster. So, so really, um, in addition to the nutritional um, spray programs that you hear about today from, from Dr. Spann, uh, as, as we all know, I think by now, uh, psyllid management is a, is a cornerstone. So one of the things that we've been really focusing our efforts on is not only making sure that we bring new uh, technologies down the pipeline and, and make sure that the insecticides that we're recommending work for psyllids, but we're, we're also continuing uh, to try to understand whether the susceptibilities of these psyllid populations throughout the state are changing to these insecticides. As, as you know, if we put out uh, the same insecticides repetitively and challenge psyllid populations to these insecticides repetitively, uh, the susceptibilities of those populations on average can change uh, because something called pesticide resistance eventually develops in those populations as we kill out the susceptible insects, uh, naturally resistant ones survive. So the um, basic management strategy for this is to rotate. Uh, if you put out pesticide A, let's say Danitol for example, you know there's going to be a portion of those psyllids that survive and it's important then to uh, go in with another mode of action to follow that up to take out hopefully those susceptible ones that survived the, the Danitol spray. So essentially we've been over the last few years going throughout Florida. Uh, we've chosen five major locations and we've monitored various aspects of um, pesticide resistance. Um, the most, uh, the, the first one uh, is um, uh, their uh, uh, susceptibility, of course, by just simply killing them and seeing what dosage takes to kill them. And then we try to figure out those underlying mechanisms. We, we measure enzymes um, th that the psyllids produce to detoxify uh, these pesticides. Psyllids have in them these natural proteins that essentially break down pesticides. These proteins are there to help them, let's say, deal with plant toxins and, and other uh, naturally occurring toxins they may encounter in nature, but they play a dual role. And in, ca in, the, in the case of pesticide resistance, they are, those same enzymes um, detoxify and, and break down enzymes and help the psyllid survive. So, so as the psyllid populations change, those detoxifying enzymes increase. Also, there are specific target sites that may um, that may change as a result of random mutations. If you've got uh, some psyllids that have that random mutation, if you spray them, those survivors can breed, reproduce, and then begin to dominate the population. So let me get to some bottom line kind of results. As, as early as 2009, we began seeing indications of psyllid populations being less susceptible uh, to some of the main insecticides that we were using. As early as 2009, we were seeing up to 35-fold uh, resistance in certain locations to um, the neonicotinoid insecticide imidacloprid. You might be familiar with this. It's the, um, it's the admire that we use as a soil drench to protect young trees. 
It's also the Provado uh, spray. That's their foliar formulation, the name for their foliar formulation. And we were seeing cross resistance, so um, to, to those neonicotinoids already showing up. And what cross resistance is is essentially you've got two insecticides that have the same mode of action. They kill the insect in the same way. So if resistance develops to one, the cross resistance happens to the other. Um, and we've we we were as early as 2009 seeing cross resistance to what was then the second neonicotinoid that became registered for Florida citrus diamethoxam. You may know that as Octara, the foliar spray, or, 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 or Platinum as the, um, as the, uh, um, uh, the soil applied uh, drench. So these are the things that we have to keep in mind. If, if you put out um, uh, the thiamethoxam products, you don't want to follow those up with the um, uh, imidacloprid products. And other things that we have to be wary of are that certain um, companies are now bringing to the market uh, pesticides that have more than one active ingredient in them as uh, mixtures. Um, in some cases these can be very useful. Um, Syngenta has some some new things like Agriflex where you've got an active ingredient um, that will kill psyllids, a neonicotinoid, and, um, and also uh, an active ingredient that will kill immature uh, leaf miners. So these products can have an important role in an overall psyllid leaf miner project, uh, program if you essentially want to kill two birds with one stone. But you have to you have to look at your 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 overall annual program in a more complex way because you don't want to follow up an agroflex with another neonicotinoid such as a Provado because again in that case you're doing back to back sprays of the same mode of action. Some other uh, new um, insecticides that are coming down like Stallion, I believe from MFC. Well, that combines a, an organophosphate and a pyrethroid, which are essentially our two best adulticides for psyllids. And I'm not quite sure what the logic behind that one is. But now if you put that one out, you're definitely going to kill you know, all your psyllids. But now you can't put out a pyrethroid or an organophosphate to follow that one up. So you got to kind of be wary um, in, in terms of these, these dual mode of action uh, products. So what are the other things we are seeing? Um, by 2010, there were reduced susceptibility le le levels to essentially every uh, product we um, tested. I mean, these, these weren't to the level that um, would uh, cause product failures. But there's been some alarming changes from 2010 to 2011. Um, particularly, we, what we do is, just to give you an idea of how we do this, we compare the susceptibility of the psyllid populations in the field with our highly laboratory susceptible population. This susceptible population in the laboratory um, isn't, has not been exposed to pesticides, so if you just, you know, it, it will die at the lowest possible dosages. So that's how we're doing our comparisons. And we've developed these things called diagnostic doses. So we have diagnostic doses for all these pesticides that should kill 95% of our laboratory susceptible um, psylla population at, you know, dose X we can pick out. And then we can see what those diagnostic doses do to field populations. And for two pesticides, again, important classes, fenpropathrim, danitol, pyrethroid, and clopyrifos, lorsban, and OP. This year, on average, from five populations in Florida, we are killing less than 60% of psyllids at a diagnostic dosage that should kill 95%. And bear in mind, that is an average. And um, in some of those locations, if you look at the numbers that comprise that average, we're killing only 25% of psyllids with fenpropathrim danitol. That should be killing 95% of psyllids. What we're finding is that this is due to increased enzyme levels, or the enzymes um, that uh, detoxify these these enzymes, uh, these insecticides. Now we haven't been able to correlate that yet in the field with a a, a bona fide 100% certain failure of the insecticide. Um, however, I have been hearing folks saying my Danitol isn't working like it used to. It takes longer for them to die. 
Uh, again, we have to confirm that in the laboratory to make sure it's, it's, it's truly due to resistance. But the, the fact is that um, you know, th this is real and we need to be on the lookout and we need to be vigilant. Any rotation is better than none. If you're using the dual active ingredient products, um, you, need to, uh, you need to be careful what you follow them up with. If you're doing aggressive young tree protection with multiple neonicotinoid insecticide uh, applications to the soil, you need to think about breaking those up with some um, foliar sprays of a different mode of action. Um, we're also identifying the specific genes and proteins again that uh, are, are causing this and to do the reason behind this is we're trying to develop something called RNAi to help mitigate the resistance where we can actually go in and pump, pump something into a tree that when the psyllid feeds on the, that that um, oh, that gene product, it, it will sh hopefully shut down these genes that code for these detoxifying enzymes. So that's something that's a little bit downstream, but more upstream stuff is we've we've done a lot of work last year, and hopefully this year we, we we're at the, we'll be at the stage where we can start making some recommendations. We've been doing optimal rotation schedules where we rotate different types of insecticides in different schemes, because what can happen is it might be better to rotate insecticide A with C rather than A with B. So we're looking at these various differing rotations so that we can um, recommend to you the most, uh, you know, the, the, the optimum rotations uh, that hopefully will uh, mitigate resistance um, or uh, even reverse it. Because it can reverse. A little bit of good news, from 2010 to 2011, in all the sites we've monitored across Florida, we have not seen a further jump in reduce susceptibility to those very important neonicotinoids, those ones that we're using to protect young trees. This is good news and this this means that we're doing something right with protecting those with the rotations that we're using. Um, in fact, um, those, those susceptibility levels uh, kind of increased from 2009 to 2010 except th they weren't statistically significant. Um, so that is good news. Um, some things we need to practice, you know, again, no back-to-back -back sprays. Cutting rates is a bad idea um, for resistance management. Area-wide sprays where we try to coordinate a, a single mode of action is probably going to be um, useful and helpful. Um, so, so, so those are things that um, should help us out. Okay, I'm going to move to leaf miner control. This is actually some research that was uh, done here in, uh, in, in this grove, or it was initiated in this grove. I'll just mention really briefly, um, you know, standard leaf miner control and then get to some of the new technology that I'm excited about and I've been working with since I've gotten to Florida and it's finally something that's available. Um, essentially, if you're, if you're protecting your foliage from leaf miner, you, we have to keep in mind that we're killing the immature insect in the leaf. The leaf's already damaged, it's feeding. Um, and really, your, your optimal time for killing that larva in the leaf is about from 13 days after bud break to up to 30 days after bud break. If you don't time your spray well for those leaf miners to be in leaves, you're, you're, you're going to not get as much of your money's worth as you would otherwise. Uh, leaf uh, psyllid uh, adulticides, like your Danitals, your Loris bands, your whatever, they'll knock down that psyllid adult pop, or psyllid, leaf miner adult population to some degree, but not enough uh, to prevent those adults from keep uh, reinfesting your, your, your leaves. So you cannot unfortunately rely on a psyllid management program to do a great job of cleaning up your leaf miners. There are some, some two birds with one stone tools that are very good. Delegate, for example. That one does a really good job on both of them. And again, if you're protecting young non-bearing trees, the neonicotinoids will do a good job on leaf miners just like, like psyllid. So that's, that's a dual control system. But if you're, if you're spraying for like Intrepid or Agrimec for, for leaf miners, you, you, you have to have infestation and you have to time it well. 
And if you get a, a, a significant flush a week after you sprayed a foliar leaf miner um, uh, spray, you're, 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 you know, th th those are going to be unprotected leaves. One technology I've been working on is more of a proactive technology rather than reactive, and that is by using pheromones to prevent the mating of um, male and female leaf miners. So you're, you're preventing the male from finding the female. You're preventing, therefore, mating and uh, egg laying. And this works very well for this particular pest because it has a powerful long-range pheromone and these tiny insects only find each other with these pheromones in the field. So what we do is we broadcast a significant amount of that pheromone into the, the, the grove and that's essentially like creating a forest fire, you know, an allergy, and they simply can't follow the smoke signals to find each other. Um, I've got a picture of a sticky trap liner in your, in your thing that has a typical leaf miner catch per week, and that's about um, 3,000 leaf miners. I have a few of these traps in my truck, and as we move to the next location, I'll bring them and I'll hand them out. I, I was going to hand them out here, and I forgot them in my truck, just a few feet down. So I'll, I'll get them if you want to try them, if you want to convince yourself how potent these lures are and how many leaf miners you can catch. But essentially, we now have, um, there is a product labeled for use in citrus. It's called Splat. It's available from this company named Iska. Um, you can find all the information if you're interested in checking it out. There are some growers in, in Florida that are, uh, have had experience with this and, and there's going to be more applications of this uh, this summer. This may be something that um, the fresh fruit people um, uh, get more excited about checking out first than, than, than processed for obvious reasons with, you know, with canker. We have, shown, have been able to show that when we prevent injury, uh, we are able to reduce canker. Um, it's not inexpensive but it's not outrageously expensive like it used to be the company has got it down to between 30 to 40 dollars an acre depending on your application rate um, there are some bottlenecks um, it can be hand applied and it can be machined applied with uh, specific uh, uh, precision machines and I describe those I won't go over you know step by step everything about those machines but there is a at least one professional applicator that's kind of doing this now uh, a, a large chunk of his time. He's out of the Fort Pierce area, David Robinson. He'll essentially bring his applicator out anywhere and, and put this stuff out. And it's essentially a viscous formulation. It looks kind of like a milkshake. Um, and the machine goes through and it blows one of these milkshake goobers onto each tree. And over time, slowly, from that wax matrix, the pheromone is released and it permeates your grove and those uh, little leaf miners can't find each other. We found, uh, again, last year we had excellent results. Um, we think that for a, a real comprehensive season-long um, management program of the leaf miner, especially in, in grapefruit, where one of my grower collaborators says he wants no infestation, which is a little bold, a little uh, optimistic, but he, he, he looked good, really good last year. But you could, you could, two applications would probably do you better than nothing. Um, and last year's applications were having it, we were conservatively estimating at eight weeks of protection per application. We've done some research in, in figuring out, you know, how little of this can you put out and still get efficacy. It's sort of, you know, the, one of those first things you want to do. And we were able to find out that uh, we, we figured out an optimal way of skipping groves, uh, uh, rows. Uh, but the optimal, it, it was better to, to, to treat a continuous area, then have a large skip, and then another continuous area, rather than doing kind of a zebra pattern every other row. So what we found is if we could treat 10 rows and then leave four untreated, 10 rows, four untreated, that worked the best for us. Um, the, the data weren't as consistent there, but the means were, uh, if you see the error bars are bigger, but the means were almost almost right on target. So, so there we're able to apply 67% of the product that's labeled and still, still look um, pretty good. So um, again, it, it, it really did a good job in, in, in preventing infestation where we researched it last year. In fact, one of my grower collaborators claimed that it was better than any insecticide applications he tried for leaf miner in the past. 
Uh, this is, has absolutely no effect on your natural enemies. It only affects the citrus leaf miner, but then the Achilles heel of a um, of a product like this is it has no uh, effect on your psyllids. So this would be strictly a leaf miner um, uh, application protocol. Some growers that have been working with are contemplating and, and looking at the numbers for hand application. That might seem um, like a lot, but you're just essentially walking and applying this to tree. It's, it's as fast as you can walk. So if you have a crew of multiple people, you can cover some ground pretty quickly, you know, walking four miles an hour. But like I said, there's a precision applicator that's a little bit of a bottleneck in Florida right now because they're, he's really the one main guy doing it. The company can contract out um, a, a helicopter applicator. And I know more people are sort of starting to um, uh, get interested in, in, in uh, applying this stuff. You, you may want to try it on a small scale and, and, and see see if you like it. Um, particularly, again, if if you're uh, um, if you're worried about canker and fresh fruit, uh, this this uh, again fully labeled and available from this company. So, well, thank you. If any other questions pop into your minds, feel free to hunt me down.